Crypto Trade. This is Don Kaufman. It's August 16th, 2019, and you are watching the Theo Trade Weekend Update. Well, ladies and gentlemen, once again, risk is in the air. And I'm going to cut to the chase right here, right now. We're going to talk about why there's a number of factors that are still pointing to, well, some wild volatility effectively ahead. And really kind of what that might mean for you when we start to uh, well, start to get into a couple of charts and we're going to get into some very detailed trade ideas. All right. First, foremost, yeah, another tumultuous week inside of the markets. Uh, major sell off, a little bit of a rally, but the rallies were not as strong as some of the sell side activity. Listen, net net this past week, we uh, ended up inside the expected move in the SPX. But I want to push all of that aside for just a moment. Again, I'll get into some of those details as we start to look at a few of the charts. Push it all aside for a second. There are very definitive risk factors that still point to, well, just that, more tumultuous times ahead, more volatility ahead. What are they? And why aren't more traders talking about them? First and foremost, let's, let's kind of, you know, go after the low hanging fruit, if you will. Huh. Low hanging fruit, no pun intended over here, because we're going to talk about low interest rates. The bonds, all right, which is specifically the ZB. I mean, effectively, we're looking at an all time high inside of the bond market, which again, indication, of course, of lower rates. We're at the lowest you know, the 30 year has ever been in the history that is, well, displays a degree of risk kind of moving forward. That unto itself, it's not enough. So push it aside. Number two factor that I want to bring up. Have you looked at the utilities lately, right? The X L U. I mean, that's a good kind of proxy. It's an ETF for the utilities. It's a good proxy for it. But if you take a look at the XLU, the utilities, they're at an all time high. Why? I don't know. It's the only place that actually has yield, but it's really kind of thought of more as a duck and cover. You know, everybody get into the utility boat. Look at some individual stocks. You know, we could start talking about Procter Gamble. Again, a lot of duck and cover in terms of where assets are flowing right now. So we're looking at bonds and obviously bonds are trading uh, effectively very close to all time highs. And then you've got the utilities on top of that. And those are, of course, at all time highs, which is uh, indicative of, again, duck and cover. Then you have to look at gold. All right. So we'll throw a metal out there at you, right? If you take a look at gold, we're looking at multiple year highs, again, kind of duck and cover. And then, then we can come over to like real estate. Now you can look at XLRE, which is kind of a, uh, a real estate ETF, or you can look at IYR. Interestingly enough, IYR, and again, we'll look at this in a few minutes here. IYR is, um, it's, it's actually going to have its highest close on record, but it's pretty much at par with where it was back in, uh, 2007. Again, you can even push that aside for a second. So now we're looking at utilities and we're looking at bonds. You know, we're looking at gold. We're looking at like real estate and specifically REITs because why they have a little bit of yield associated with them. Now there's four factors and there's a bunch of stocks, of course, that are thought of, you know, risk reduction. And again, everything seems to point to kind of duck and cover. But in the short term, some more of the disconcerting areas. Have you looked at things like the VVIX? That's the volatility of the volatility index is hovering in and around the 110. Now I was talking a moment ago about ducking and covering. I've always called the VVIX, again, the volatility of the volatility index. What it really kind of pertains to, it's, it's really premium buying of a lot of professionals. Um, if the VVIX is higher, it's the volatility of the options in the VIX are up there. Again, typically means that professionals are net buyers, net buyers of premium. Now, most professionals, they don't like to go out there and to buy option premium. So to see the VVIX at like 110, that's the level I often say. That's when you're supposed to like get under your desk, start rocking back and forth. I mean, that's a very, very serious okay, indication, again, of more risk ahead. And we're not done. Okay. Everything that we're looking at right now pertains to more risk and again, highly volatile markets. Now, I'm not 
ready to just call this, that's it, the markets are going to tank over here. There is clearly evidence that the administration is doing everything that they possibly can to bid up the markets. I mean, we've actually convinced ourselves at this point that they're watching the S&P futures and they're like, wait for it, wait for the cash open tweet. Okay, it's been a tweet twastic kind of a week and uh, the market has been bid up a couple of times on a number of those tweets. Nevertheless, okay, when you start looking at these risk factors, clearly they're not buying it, okay? They're just simply not buying it. And we're right at the verge, you know, people talk about like buy the dip, right at the verge of, hey, maybe that stopped working. Maybe it stopped working back in, you know, December of 2018. But at this point, that buy the dip has absolutely not worked. The last factor I wanna get into, and I wanna get you thinking about this before we show you on the charts, liquidity in the equity side of the business. I'm talking about stock liquidity. It's brutal. It's non-existent. And today, which is Friday here, we're coming into the cash close. There's no liquidity in this upside move. The S&Ps are up, you know, some 40 odd points over here. There's nothing behind it. We are up there on air, people. And with that, let's get into it. A couple of charts, a few trade ideas. All right, to some of the charts and trades we go. So sticking with our theme of this weekend's update, these factors point towards more volatility ahead. Now, before I get to those factors, which we're going to call it the risk check rundown, one of the things that I want to point out and one of the things that I rely on extensively in the midst of volatility are these gravity points. These gravity points are just giving me orientation of kind of where we are overall. And one of the most striking things to me right here, right now in this marketplace is just, hey, listen, okay, everything that we've been through and people, it's been volatile like the last three weeks, you know, and I use this uh, this terminology all the time. I mean, come on, well, this is Mr. Toad's wild ride in the last couple of weeks, expanded ranges. I mean, you know, just earlier this week, we saw, 25.1 minute moves in the S&P futures. That is good stuff. I mean, traders, we live for this stuff. Nevertheless, okay, for general orientation, use these gravity points, the 2911, the 2842, even the uh, 2811. I mean, for the most part, all of them have kind of made appearances in the last uh, two weeks of trade. I, I mean, pretty much everything made an appearance <laughs> in uh, in this week of trade just in the last couple of days. But one of the things I was pointing out a moment ago is, you know, that uh, that kind of that theme of you must buy the dip. Listen, it ain't over yet. OK, but those dips have been sold into. And here we are. We're bid back up, obviously, on this uh, on this Friday afternoon. And uh, there's no question this marketplace is uh, it's dangerous right now. And that's exactly what I want to point out. There's these hallmarks kind of along the way. And those are these gravity points. If we're going to see some sell side activity, you know, hey, market 2811 is a very likely scenario for us, as I was saying, uh, early next week. But uh, next week, I think you could probably, you know, bank on the fact that we may have to check that box at 2911. Once again, again, you get to those gravity points, they're stopping part, uh, points along the way, literally a place where you can kind of get your bearings. And that's why I mention them, because in the midst of some real volatility, okay, opinions, they just don't matter. What matters, again, is that you got your risk in check and you can kind of put your risk in check using these particular points. Now, let's get down to this. This is the risk check rundown. So I was mentioning a couple of products just a few minutes ago here on the video portion that, I mean, it's just striking at this point. Let's let's start for a second, okay, with the bonds. So the bonds late, again, late on Friday here, they've backed off a little bit, okay, but we've kind of seen this movie before. Now, we'll talk about the possibility of bonds backing off in just a moment, but the bonds, this defines parabolic. Now, with those bonds, Okay. You can look at TYX and TYX. That's the interest rate. That's the 30-year treasury index associated with those bonds. It's an outright crash in the last three weeks. I mean, interest rates are diving down. You know, I've heard a lot of traders also kind of mention like, this is unsustainable, the move to the downside. But then I start to back away from all the noise out there and think to myself, hey, uh, wait a second. They have negative on the 10 year, their negative interest rate in the 10 year over in Germany. They've got negative rates all over the world. Hey, why not? Okay. These other sovereignties. And if you uh, read some articles 
in just the last couple of days, Japan is now uh, the the largest. They've overtaken China in terms of the largest debt holder of uh, U.S. treasuries, which uh, makes sense because they have negative interest rates, meaning that they can actually print their own money and come over here and yield like 2% on money that they printed. It's a brilliant idea. But of course, that's going to continue to drive our uh, our rates down to a degree. Nevertheless, the reason of them saying this is because if you think for a second that this is unsustainable, okay, now well, that may not, uh, may not be relative. And again, net net, our interest rates compared to a lot of the civilized world is, uh, well, they're still high on a relative basis. So uh, that's a little bit of bonds. Bonds, again, still point to more risk. Next, let's cruise over to volatility futures. If you look at volatility futures, one of the first things I wanted to note, first of all, well, these volatility futures, they're like, oh, look at them. They came off big. All right, you're looking at the wrong volatility futures. You're looking at the wrong ones. Don't look, don't look at the five-day volatility future right? You got to go a little bit further out in time. Now I'm going to close up this left side bar. When I say a little bit further out in time, you got to have a little meat behind it. You want to look at like the VX, okay? U19. Now the U19, that volatility future is going to be a bit more effective. Yeah, it came down a little bit. Not a whole lot. <laughs> I mean, listen, I'm looking at this and I'm, I, I've looked at it time and again and I'm like, oh, you know, like, listen, the S&Ps were up 40 points today. Somebody forgets to tell the volatility futures. I know, I know. A lot of people are like, but but I look at the VIX, okay, and 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 the VIX, the VIX, what? The VIX didn't come down that much either. I mean, listen, we've been in this territory before inside of the S and P's, and yet volatility, it's not backing off like you would have anticipated it to. The other thing that you have to contend with in terms of volatility, specifically the volatility futures, the volatility futures, the skew is still in uh, what we term backwardation or inverted, I prefer to use the term like an inverted skew, that is, there are 33-day volatility futures versus the 61 versus the 96, okay, here, we're 19, what, 40, okay, 19, we'll call it 20, 18, the volatility is still in backwardation, looks like this, that is, there's still more risk in the near term than there is in the far term, what they're effectively saying is, risk is now, risk is imminent, risk is in the next 33 days, and then the risk abates the longer you go out in time, so what does it say? Well, I just told you, risk, it's still here. So you got the bonds that are rocking. You got the volatility futures that are rocking. Let's cruise over to the VVIX. The VVIX, the volatility of the volatility index, better known as the most confusing product ever developed. Listen, the VVIX, it's in duck and cover. As I said a moment ago, this is get under your desk, start rocking back and forth because when the VVIX is north of 110, okay, that that's not, you know, mom and pop selling a covered call, right? That's you know, the mother of all trading firms that are reducing their risks. Look at options that are like, what, 32 days out. Forget that I have a position. Yes, I have a bullish position in the VIX. Put it aside for a second. Open up every option in here. Go look at volume and open interest, right? There's activity in here. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of contracts, but the VVIX, and I'm just going to point out, like the VVIX and the VIX, the VIX options didn't trade like huge amounts of volume today, okay? But there's just no question. There are trading firms, even though the VVIX closed down, okay? It closed down such a negligible amount, which tells you that even in a big up day, there's still trading firms buying up risk. That's the only point that I wanted to make with this. Like, listen, if the VVIX says it's at 110, it just means like, hey, okay? Trading firms don't believe that there isn't risk out there. Mm. So what basically it's saying is, yeah, I, I should believe that there's risk out there. All right, so we looked at the bonds. There's risk in the air. Volatility futures, they're in backwardation. Risk in the air. VVIX, duck and cover. Now we go over to what I was mentioning a moment ago, the XLRE. What is it? Ah, it's a real estate sector. They kind of spun off. It was uh, only a couple of years ago they spun it off, but here, the maximum chart, that's eh, effectively at an all-time high. And uh, again, you know, this is a dividend paying, dividend paying little animal of about 3%. You can also look at IYR. If you take a look at IYR, it's a uh, trust U.S. real estate ETF. I'm not here to tell you to buy this. I'm not here to tell you to buy this. I want to make that clear. I'm here to show you that a 3% yield, okay, apparently is all that and a bag of chips. Oh, looky, looky, looky. Okay, that's the all-time high, and this is uh, effectively where we closed today. We closed at 91.50, 91.50. Now, if you go back in time, okay, 
you'll actually see the highest close for this thing. The highest close back in time would have been right there, which is 91.50. Ooh, it was actually 49 back there. That's the highest close ever inside of the IYR. Again, point, point made, right? I think you guys get it. Then we can actually go over to the XLU. Yeah, I didn't have that on the list, but I'll just throw it in there because it's fun. Why? The utilities, all-time high. Why? They pay a 3% dividend. Need I go further? Sure, why not? Let's actually pull up gold. Listen, gold, gold's gold been rocking to a degree. It's down some $7 today, but the, uh, the metals, okay, they've been higher, but they're still dangerous right now. And you better respect the fact that, okay, if you look at like a day-to-day -day chart, they didn't really come down at all. They look just like the bonds. So if you look at this risk check rundown, everything on here is pointing to risk. Now, let's get to the next point I want to make. Back off, bonds. Well, if the bonds are going to back off, which I haven't really seen yet, this is an intraday chart, I haven't really seen the bonds back off, hey, okay, then you could actually get, if the bonds were to back off and back off rapidly, you could get the financials rocking back to the upside, okay? On a day-to-day -day basis, the only point that I want to make with this is, yes, all of these signs point to more risk, right? But if the bonds really start rocking and start to back off again, you're going to get some explosive moves back to the upside, which the only reason I'm pointing this out is to get you, okay, to be keying in onto what really makes a difference and what really matters in this marketplace. And we are bond-centric right now. You know, one of the things I'm going to show you here, it's my next bullet, liquidity, okay? Take a look at liquidity inside of the ZB. Now, the ZB, okay, the bonds, and nothing doing, nothing doing spike, nothing doing, nothing doing spike. Listen, some of these spikes, there were rolls in here. That's a roll. Forget about that. But I just want you to see, okay, that, that's some volume, all right? Liquidity in here is a rockin'. It is a rockin'. You pull up like five years, even on a five-year chart, you can see the liquidity right now is a rockin' inside of the bonds. You don't believe the, the bonds? Go over to the ZN. It's rockin'. Again, the bond market is kind of like the place that's driving a lot of the order flow. That's why I say if the bonds back off, hey, game over, man. We may actually rally back up a little bit, but I would think that that's probably going to be short-lived. Now, we come to liquidity or lack thereof. Now, when you start looking at the S&P futures, let's bring up the S&P futures just in a nine month, okay? Over the last nine months, I think I can make an argument. Like, all right, back here was pretty crazy times. Things kind of died out and a little crazy, a little crazy again, and it's getting a little crazy again. Listen, there's some liquidity inside of the S&P futures, right? Got it, that's over the last nine months. Open up even like a 10 year, okay? On a 10 year though, I gotta tell you, liquidity, uh, it ain't great. Maybe it's a little bit of a blip on the radar screen. Liquidity's not great, like on a 10 year inside of the S&Ps, but that's not the, the area that I wanna focus on. The area I wanna focus on is in the equity products. And the equity products, the liquidity out there, it's brutal, hideous. I'm hideous, look away. Um, no, it really is, it's terrible. Liquidity is just, I mean, listen, this is a 10-year. I don't have to pull up a 10-year. I think you get it. Just look at it like a three-year. And a three-year, okay, we're in pretty serious times right now. I mean, this is, that's serious times. The liquidity, it's terrible out there. It's horrible. I mean, come on, the liquidity was actually greater, all right, in, in very minimal periods of sell-side activity in here. The liquidity is non-existent. That's Apple. Now, I don't have to pull up Apple. I could just pull up any of the big tech stocks. Look at liquidity in Facebook. It's brutal. No one's trading the equities right now. They're just, it's just non-existent. It's bothersome too. You look at Caterpillar. Caterpillar's falling flat on its face lately. It's just a three year. Caterpillar falling flat on its face. One of the things I like to look for is equities that are falling flat on their face, getting spikes in volume. Do you see a spike in volume? Not on a three year, okay? I definitely don't see it. What? This is on a nine month. I can, this is a daily. This is nine months. There's no spike in volume, okay? I can pull up like Boeing. Boeing is like a marquee for the uh, for the Dow. There's no liquidity punch in there. The punch is like, oh, listen, I'm looking for spikes in liquidity. See over here, that's a spike in liquidity. There's nothing going on right now. It is extraordinary. It's disconcerting. I don't know how else to put it, but everywhere I look, okay, the liquidity is dead. Even like Starbucks, and I'm, I'm bringing up Starbucks because it's been used as a defensive stock. Or you start to look at stuff like XLU. Here's the irony. XLU, this thing's hitting an all-time high. Eh, it's actually got a couple of spikes in terms of liquidity over there. Let's look at the banks. Okay, the banks, nothing doing. That's on a nine month. If you take a look at a bank for the last three years, okay, again, liquidity, 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 it isn't there. Where is the liquidity? I don't know. 
And frankly, I'm a little nervous because I don't want to find out and be on the wrong side of it. Okay, but you talk about like buy the dip or sell for that matter. There's nobody on either side of it. They're trading S&P futures. Okay, they're trading lots of options, but they're not trading the stocks out there. Okay, we are in a, uh, a very strange area right now. Now, financial volatility. Now, I wanted to actually break this away. Financial volatility kind of falls into the risk check rundown, but I really wanted to break it away because it deserves its own little, uh, well, little, I guess, stance in here. And that is here are the uh, financials, the XLF. First of all, the, uh, the Maginot line is set at 2650. That's not what I wanted to show you. Okay. What I wanted to show you in here is take a look at like next week, all right? The volatility is really pumped up. 20, 25% in terms of volatility for uh, for next week of trade. 76, 76 cent uh, expected move. It's crazy out there. Seriously, it's starting to rock. And if you take a look at the uh, auto expected move over here, we cracked we cracked the expected move this week and we actually came right back into the edge of it in terms of the financials. But uh, the financials are right at that marginal line of 2650. It's again, it's another sign of risk. All eyes have to be on the financials, but the financials are being driven a lot by the bonds. Okay, meager bounces. Let's get to some meager bounces. Here's individual stocks. Okay, the reason I want to bring up this is, you know, I was talking about buy the dip a moment ago, and I've got positions all over Caterpillar. Okay, in terms of buy the dip, apparently nobody agrees with that in terms of Caterpillar. But hey, it's still early in the process. Maybe Caterpillar can take off to the upside. But there's a bunch of stocks. Again, you've seen a bounce in the marketplace, but a bunch of stocks just can't get out of their own way. You look at Caterpillar. Great. Okay. And I brought this up the other day and you look at Boeing. Uh, can't get out of its own way. And now I'm going across different sectors. Now I want to bring up like Intel. All right. Now Intel. Okay. It had bad. That was a while ago. It's not bouncing like you would have thought it would. Okay. You take a look at uh, XLE, the energy sector. Right. And we're going to look at this momentarily again, not bouncing substantially. Okay. Bank of America. I want to look at least one stock and everything. All right. A little bit of a bid under Bank of America, but this thing can't get out of its own way. And last but not least, the Facebook. Okay. There's no bid really under it. There, the bounce and fade is where you want to be, but the bounces that are occurring, okay, in some marquee underlyings, are again, they're non existent. And I cannot stress that enough because it leads you to believe like, all right, this this is a big catch 22 right now. You know, when you start to talk about like, you know, the idea of these things are meager bounces, even in a big again, today was a big up day, right? The S&Ps are up one and a half percent. The Nasdaq's up one and a half percent. Facebook, Facebook's up like 0.6 percent. Just look at some of the percentages down my screen over here and you're going to see there are some areas that are really lagging. And the irony of that is they're being masked. And they're being masked by handfuls of big market cap stocks that kind of cover up the tracks of how bad, okay, some of these bounces really are. And that's what I'm saying. Like, there's no liquidity. Nobody's out there on the bid, meaning they're not really, like, heavily buying, okay? All they're doing is letting some of the big market caps bounce, and everything else kind of just meanders in the background. So meager bounces. Now, that does lead us, though, to more what we term bounce and fade trades. Now, a moment ago, I brought up the energy sector, XLE. In terms of XLE, had a little bit of a bounce, but I like this one. I've actually put a bullish in-out spread Okay, 35 days out. That's one I executed in the chat room today. A little bit of a bullish spread because I figured to myself in the next 35 days, come on, we got to bounce, right? There's got to be a bounce. Oil, okay? Oil is not tracking well with the energy stocks themselves or vice versa. The energy stocks are not necessarily tracking well with oil. So nevertheless, I am still uh, taking, okay, uh, a mild but bullish position inside of the energy sector looking for a bounce back to the upside. On the flip side of that, okay, Costco. Costco, this one has had uh, kind of a wicked bounce and it's it's unscathed. Now I've been talking about unscathed stocks, okay? And you can see loaded up in a couple of bearish positions, okay? You could use either a duration bearish position, which means you're in this one for the long haul in excess of three months, or you can actually go out like, for example, 28 days and just use an in-out spread and go after it that way. Whichever way you want to go after this, okay? This is a stock that, again, in the next 28 days, we feel is going to have some degree of a fade, okay? I mean, this is not like a place that you want to protect yourself, right? This is, it's according to retail sales, 
And we're seeing things like industrial production slow down, you know, around the world. We haven't seen retail sales, though, take all that hit. And last but not least, in terms of balance of fade, I want to fade Apple. Apple has ripped back to the upside after uh, what was a hideous move after the earnings. It's ripped back to the upside. I believe this is going to be a decent fade trade. I'm 28 days out. It's an in-out spread. Again, bounce and fade is the place you want to be. Define risk spreads in the midst of, well, what looks like we're going to have a lot more volatility ahead. And last but definitely not least, the SPX expected move. What can we expect for the next week of trade? Well, the irony is exactly what we got uh, the previous week. We're looking at a $58, again, a $58 expected move, specifically $57.96. What was the expected move last week? As I said, it's the exact same animal. Look at this. After everything that we've seen, this was last week. It was expecting a $58 move. I mean, we had a 100-point move in one trading session. After everything that we've seen this past week, they're still not bumping up this volatility. I'm still not selling premium, not selling premium as it pertains to the uh, to the broader index products. With that, again, those are the factors that we really believe are going to lead to uh, more volatility ahead. Have a wonderful weekend and uh, get strapped into the trading seat uh, bright and early on Monday morning because we're going to be back at it. Good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.